Bob and to all of our orchestra and our musicians. We, we missed you guys last Sunday. We were back home to be with our families over the Christmas break, and thank you for that time. We uh, got to be with them, and thank you for praying for us. Uh, it was it was a good time to be together, and it was uh, good to see all the family. We don't get that ch opportunity very much or that time very much, so we're thankful for that. But we're ready to come back and begin a new year with you here in Psalm 86. As we begin this new year here at St. Clair Southern Baptist Church, I would like to ask you to do something this year, and that's to memorize these verses, specifically verse 11, 12, and the first part of verse 13. You see that on the screen there. And I want you not only to memorize them, but be able to quote them with me as a call to worship for 2021. As a matter of fact, I want us to get into this practice each year with a portion, uh, using a portion of God's Word and memorizing it and, and quoting it together. Now, before you say, oh, Brother Bill, I'm too old, I can't memorize, I've never been good at this, we're going to keep showing you this and showing you this and showing you this. It's in the top of your bulletin at the header box at the top of the page there. So we want you to be able to see this, and by repetition, that's how you memorize stuff, you just keep repeating it that you'll use this as a call to worship this year so that you can say them with me every Sunday morning when it comes time to call ourselves to worship the Almighty God. Now, there's lots of ways to memorize Scripture, by the way. There's not just one way. There's more than one way. You might want to just fold this bulletin up and, and carry it around with you, keep it in your pocket so you can look at it throughout the day. Or you could prop it up or tape it to your refrigerator in your kitchen so you see it every day. And, and try to memorize these verses from the Word of God. I cannot overly stress to you the importance of memorizing the Word of God. It matters, folks, that you have the Word of God so deeply in your head that you can call it from memory. It's a very helpful thing to, to have big portions of the Word of God committed to memory. People say, well, how do you know that much? It's because we practice at it that we, we know this stuff and memorize this stuff. I don't know about you, but I find it very helpful whenever I'm driving along, because obviously when you're driving a car, you can't be reading then, of course, to call to mind verses of Scripture and reflect on those verses and sometimes even try to sermonize those verses like we're doing here today where I can come up with sermons or messages on various verses and themes that I've committed to memory. So it will do a tremendous amount of good to memorize Scripture. By the way, Although it's unlikely any of us will ever go through something like this experience I'm about to tell you. Some time ago, I heard about some prisoners of war. They were locked away, and they didn't have a Bible. They didn't have a printed copy of the Word of God. But they were able to share with one another verses of Scripture that they had memorized as children. If you think it doesn't matter that you start off memorizing as children, oh, it does matter. Because the sooner it gets in your head, the longer it has a chance to stay there. Well, these prisoners of war were beginning to share verses they memorized as kids, and they created something of their own Bible while they were there in the prison camp, and it was a blessing to them, and it was a strength to them. Now, you and I don't know when we may be cast into a situation like that, by the way, where we are physically unable to even read the Bible, because some of us will suffer from some things, like people I know who have suffered from Parkinson's disease. I know of a, of a lady years ago who was not even able to adjust her glasses on her nose, could not even work the remote of her television. She couldn't move at all as the Parkinson's got worse and worse and worse. And even though she couldn't hold a Bible and read it anymore, she would just replay in her mind, in her memory, the verses she had memorized earlier in her life. Even though she couldn't read it, she memorized it. So as you memorize this, these verses can just roll through your mind, and you can go over them and reflect on them. And enjoy them. So memorization is very important. I want to say that to you at the outset here. And I urge this upon you. One of the things that helps us to memorize is understanding. So I want to spend this time with you this morning in verses 11, 12, and the first part of verse 13. Helping you understand what David is talking about. It's always easier to memorize something if you understand what it is you're memorizing. So today, we want to spend some time with that. Looking at these verses of scripture from Psalm 86 as we've chosen to use them as our call to worship for 2021. And I said to you, if you saw it in your bulletin, this is a prayer for the new year because this is a prayer from David writing Psalm 86. And as I looked at these verses, it occurred to me that we have a good prayer here for a new year. 
A good prayer for, to start off a new year. Here we are on this first Sunday of 2021 facing a new year, and here we have a good prayer for the new year. I don't think the person who wrote this 86th Psalm, David, wrote this as a new year psalm. I don't think he did it for that reason. I seriously doubt that he was making the transition from one year to another here like we are. I don't think that's what he was doing here. I don't think uh, that he prayed this prayer as a New Year's prayer. I, I doubt that that was the case, but whatever it was, or whatever the reason was he wrote this as God inspired him, he wrote what turned out to be a good prayer for, for a particular time that focuses on a new year, especially these verses that we've got here in Psalm 86. This really is a good prayer for the new year. So if you've got your bulletin, or Larry, I'm going to ask you to put that back on the screen if you would. I want you to look at those verses with me. And if you don't have the bulletin, you'll, uh, you'll find them here in Psalm 86, verses 11 through 13. And I want us to read these verses together. Now, these, the, what I'm reading to you and what we've got on the screen here is from the New King James Version. Uh, now, if you don't have that, well, we're actually to adjust to that as you memorize this. And these are some great verses. So would you read these verses with me together, starting in verse 11. Here we go. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy toward me. There it is. Great is your mercy toward me. Aren't those great words? Aren't those good? Great is your mercy towards me. Those words really do amount to a good prayer for the new year. So let me give you some general observations about these verses. I want to give you four of them here this morning. Here's the first one. As I said, first of all, this is a prayer. My, my little subtext in my Bible says a prayer of David. Uh, this, this song is in the form of a prayer here. And I cannot emphasize for you enough how important prayer is. Folks, if you didn't pray through 2020, I don't know how you couldn't pray through that. But folks, I want to encourage you, don't stop praying because this year is going to need prayer too, is it not? Now you know it is. As we go into this new year, we would do well to make a fresh commitment of ourselves to pray. And I know when I call you to prayer that, that I'm calling you to do the hardest thing that a Christian is ever asked to do. Now, I'll just open up the book of my life here for a moment and let you see a page from Bill Savage's life and tell you, this may shock you, but here's the truth. The devil fights me more on this matter of prayer than anything else. Does that surprise you? He fights me more on this than anything else. I can do anything easier than I can pray. I can study. I can crank out sermons. I can make visits. I can counsel people. I can do practically anything in the Christian world, easier than I can pray. Now, you'd say, why is that? Why would this be so hard? Here's why. The devil fights me here on this issue of prayer. And maybe you're much more advanced in spiritual things than me, and the devil doesn't fight you as he does me like this. But the reason I think the devil fights me, and most of us, I'll, I'll dare say, so, ser so seriously and so vigorously... At this point, is because prayer is so very important. Why would he try so hard to stop it if it wasn't so important? Does that make sense? It's so important. And I could demonstrate to you, as I have on many occasions, how important prayer is. I could talk to you about Jesus back there in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 13, saying after he had cleansed the temple, when he drove out the money changers, remember what he says? My house is to be or called a house of prayer. You remember that? He says that. This is the thing that characterizes God's house. It's called a house of prayer. You notice every Sunday we pray several times. Folks, that's intentional because we need to pray, do we not? We need to pray. I wonder today if you were to ask what one word characterizes most churches. How long would it take us to get to pray? They're a praying church. We can say it's a church of promotion. Boy, do they promote stuff. They sure do. But what about prayer? We can say it's a church of high energy and excitement. But what about prayer? Well, it's a church of great fellowship and sweet spirit. But what about prayer? Do they pray? It's a church of preaching. Well, great, but what about prayer? Does that church pray? I'm calling you to prayer today on this first Sunday of 2021. This here in Psalm 86 is a prayer. And I think one of St. Clair Southern's best moments was when we made a commitment to pray some time ago, 
for revival. About three and a half years or so ago, we began to pray for that. And I hope we would learn from Psalm 86 about the importance of prayer and redouble our efforts in prayer. I hear this a lot in the news, so-and-so doubled down on something. Folks, can we double down on praying in 2021? Oh, I hope so, because we should. Now, thank God there are many ways to pray. We need to be engaged in private prayer when you're alone and away from everybody else, and in group prayer when you're together with brothers and sisters. Our church offers various opportunities for praying together with others. We meet on Thursday mornings at 8 o'clock. And I know some people don't even know that hour exists. I understand that. But folks, we get up at 8 o'clock in the morning. We pray together for revival and for other things going on in our church. And what a wonderful time it is. You can ask the people to go there. I've listened to other people in this church pray, weeping with their tears coming down because they care about what God does here and they care for other people. Anyone who wants to join us is invited to come. And pray with us. It's simply a group of God's people. These are not superior saints and super saints. These are regular everyday people who are praying to God, crying out to God, pouring out their heart to God, asking God to do things here at the church, specifically to send revival. We feel like it's almost dishonoring to God to ask Him to send revival when, we, when we've got one scheduled. You know, we had one scheduled last fall. And we had to change that. But it's, we feel it's almost dishonoring to God to ask God to send it and then us not pray for it. The Bible's clear. We must pray for this or it's not going to come. We weren't able to have our revival services this past fall, but several of us felt the need to keep on praying for revival even though we couldn't meet last fall. Because, folks, would you listen to this clearly this morning? We still need revival, do we not? I'll try that again. We still need revival, do we not? We need it. And you're invited to come and pray with us if you're available at that time. Now, we also pray together on Wednesday nights. We call it prayer meeting. We pray specifically. So Psalm 86 is a prayer, and it reminds us of how important prayer is for this new year. Well, here's one of these observations. Here's the first one. To be more specific, as you look at Psalm 86, verses 11 through 13, first of all, this is a prayer for guidance. Look at the first phrase of verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Here's a prayer for guidance. David is talking about how God has delivered him from danger many times. If you know the life of David, God spared his life many, many times. Got him out of danger many times. And David wanted to walk, that word there, I will walk in your truth. He wanted to walk or live so as to please and honor God. When the Bible talks about our walk, it's talking about our life, how we live. Does it please God? Does it honor God? How many ways are there stretching out before us this year as we stand here at this time of transition from one year to another? So many different ways, so many different paths out in front of us that we could walk. Which ones will we walk? David says, I will walk in your truth. Do you understand, ladies and gentlemen, that God has a path for us to walk? He does. He really does. And do you understand that God's path is the absolute best path that we could possibly walk? Do you, do you agree with that this morning? That God's way is the best way? Would you agree? Would you want more people to agree that God's way is the best way? It would sure make a difference in our world, would it not? If more people agreed God's way is the best way and God's path is the best path. Jeremiah puts it this way in Jeremiah 6:16. He says, God's way is the good way. People say, well, what's the best way to get to so-and-so? Here's the best way to live, God's way. That's the best way, the best way to live, best way to walk. Now, it doesn't seem to be today, for there are many people who will be quick to tell you that God's commandments just suck all the joy out of life. They just drain all the joy out of life. Well, that's no fun just to go to church and hear somebody scream up there for a while. But God's commandments were given for our good. And they're given to us so that we would truly enter into what life is all about in the first place and find true happiness and true joy and true meaning in life. You've noticed the people that are lost, they don't know what life is worth. They have no point or purpose to their lives. Thank God He has a way. I'm glad He's got a way, don't you? I'm glad He's got one. And as we stand here today at the beginning of a new year with all sorts of ways stretching out before us, let us pray that God will teach us his way. David says, teach me your way, O Lord. 
This is a prayer for God to guide us. And would to God that you and I would enter into it and say, Lord, teach me your way. How much we need God's way today. Amen? We need it. Oh, we need God's way. You see it every day. What happens when people don't follow God's way? You see it. It's not just death and destruction. It's despair. It's discouragement. That's what happens when you don't go God's way. But when you go God's way, David says, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. So that's the first thing we see about this. This is a prayer for guidance. Here's a second thing as you look further here in Psalm 86. You see, it's also a prayer for a united heart. Look at the last part of verse 11. Unite my heart to fear your name. Where David says, unite my heart to fear your name. David is admitting something about himself, and by admitting something about himself, he's actually admitting something about all of us. And here it is. Do you not feel the pull to a divided heart? Do you not feel that every day of your life? A divided heart is a heart that is not single or specific in its allegiance and its devotion. And oh, my friends, we constantly have things pulling at us, do we not? The psalmist says, unite my heart to fear your name. He talks here about what it is, about what is due to God. Have you thought about that lately? What does God deserve? Have you thought about what is due to God? What is due to God is what he says here. Unite my heart to fear your name. God deserves for his name to be feared, does he not? And we talk about the name of God, we're talking about who he is, his character, his characteristics. God deserves that, to fear his name. It refers to God himself, all that he is, all that he does. And the great responsibility that rests upon us, brothers and sisters in Christ, is to fear the name of God. Sadly, most folks don't anymore. Ah, well, he's up there somewhere just watching everything happen. Folks, this is the God who does things. He is actively involved in our lives. Aren't you glad he is? Where would we be if he wasn't? How about that idea? Realize who God is. To realize his character. To realize what God has done. And to stand in awe, to stand in reverence and respect before such a God. That's what's all wrapped up in that little word, or little phrase, I should say, fear your name. That's all wrapped up in that. This is our task. This is our job. We must fear the name of God. For folks, it's obvious the sinful world, the lost world is not going to do that. But the people of God must fear the name of God. We must respect, we must reverence God for who He is, for what He's done. But we constantly have things pulling at us, pulling us to, to take us away from this solemn responsibility to respect and reverence His name. They pull on us all the time. And if you're wise, you will pray with the psalmist these words, Unite my heart to fear your name. Oh Lord, I've got such a divided heart. I can say that about myself, don't you? You know what this is like, don't you? Here's your divided heart. You... You're here on the Lord's day, you're here in the Lord's house, and you're caught up in the worship service. You enjoy the music, you enjoy the praises, we lift to God. And on a good Sunday, you might even enjoy the sermon a little bit more than you have before. And you think how wonderful it is, but it seems like you're no sooner out the doors of the building than you feel the world pulling at you and pulling you from these things. It's drawing and seeking your time and your energy. And then you find yourself battling what David battled here, the divided heart. He says, unite my heart because my heart is being pulled apart by the things of this world, God. Oh, how wise we would be if we would pray, unite my heart. If I am to give, if I am to give God what He deserves, what is due Him, it is the reverence and respect that is due Him. And to do that, I must have a devoted heart, a determined heart. A heart that is set completely on giving Him honor and praise. So here, my friends, is a prayer not only for guidance, but it's also a prayer for a united heart. Here's a third observation. It's a prayer of determination as well. A prayer of commitment. Not only just a prayer for guidance and a prayer of a united heart, but also a prayer of determination and commitment. Or we might say it here at this time of year, it's a prayer of resolution. You hear people do this all the time, don't you? A New Year's resolution. What's your resolution this year? Uh, and what do they say most people? Break them within two weeks? I don't know, something like that, whatever it is. 
But this man David here in Psalm 86 is resolving here. He is determining here. He resolves back there in verse 11 when he says, I will walk in your truth. That's his resolve. That's his commitment. That's his determination. I will walk in your truth, he says. You know, there's no need to ask God for guidance if you're not willing to walk according to the truth of the word of God. So this one resolve that David makes is, I will walk in your truth. But then further in verse 12, he says, I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. Now I think it would have been challenging enough if David would have just said, I will praise you, O Lord my God. I almost wish he would have just stopped and said, I will praise you, O Lord my God. Before he adds that next phrase there, where that, now that next phrase where he says, with all my heart, I don't know about you, but that binds me, that pinches me, that challenges me. He says, I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. How many of us can honestly say that we are praising the Lord God wholeheartedly with all our heart? This is his resolve. He has his heart in it. Is your heart in it when you come to the house of God? When you sing, when you pray, when you lift up his name, when you hear his word? Is your whole heart in it? He says, I will glorify your name forevermore in the last part of verse 12. And I will glorify your name forevermore. It is a prayer of determination, a prayer of commitment, a prayer of resolution, if you will, a prayer of resolve. Now, why would this man, David, desire to praise God? There are some people where this is part, uh, where this part that, that David writes here, this is the part that stands out in their lives. We, we know people, folks like that. It seems like they are intoxicated with praying and praising God. They just do it all the time. It seems like the adoration of God to them is so typical of them. It's what you hear out of them on a regular basis. It is the very sum and substance of their lives, adoration. They love God. They adore God. They seem to thrive on adoring God. They love Him. Have you ever wondered about those people? What is it with those people? Have you ever, ever said, why is it that some people just seem to be so delighted with the things of God? They just seem to be so engaged and absorbed in the things of God. What is it with this writer, this psalmist? What is it with David here? Why does he say those words in verse 12, I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Why does David do this? Is he just waxing Poetic, just becoming poetic? Is he, is he just taking poetic license here? Is that what he's doing? Is he just getting carried away with himself? When he says, I'll praise you forever, Lord. I'll never stop praising you. Well, you will never understand the language like that until you go on to read that next phrase. Look at the last part there, he says in verse 13. For great is your mercy toward me. This is why David said this. This is why he could say, I will praise your name forever. Oh, my friends, you'll never be able to resolve as the psalmist did. He says, I will praise you with my whole heart until it has been planted deep within you in the very depths of your soul, your heart, your mind, that God has shown mercy to you. Would you agree with me, church, that God has shown you mercy? And would you agree he has shown you a lot of mercy? Would you agree with that? He has shown you mercy in abundant measure. Did you see up there, or rather down there in verse 15? You, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Aren't you glad God is abundant in mercy? Can you imagine where we'd be if He wasn't? Mercy. How's it go? That old song we sing? Mercy. There was great and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Remember that? That's how that goes. To be a Christian means that God has shown us mercy in abundant measure. Now, if you don't have the resolve or the determination to praise, it's not because you've not received mercy. It's because you have not reflected on that mercy. You have not thought seriously and deeply on the mercy that you have received. If you're sitting here saved, you know this. God has been merciful to you because, folks, what do we deserve? We, don't, we do not deserve heaven. We don't. 
Heaven is a perfect place made for perfect people. Well, you've just turned heaven into a ghost town, Brother Bill. No. The only reason we get to go is because a perfect person made it possible for us imperfect people to get there. Amen? That's how we get there. We reflect deeply and seriously on His mercy. God has been merciful to you. And if you're sitting here lost, let me just say, He's been merciful to you too. Well, now, wait a minute. I, you don't know what my week was like. Oh, yeah, you think it's bad? Try it without God. You think it's bad with Him? Try it without Him. The proper response to mercy is to say, I will praise you, O oh Lord. God has lifted us up out of the dirt, out of the muck, out of the mire of sin. He has delivered us up from condemnation. He has delivered us from an eternity in hell. He has adopted us into his own family and given us a title to eternal glory. I will praise you, O Lord. What else can you say when you go over redemption's ground? You've got to say, I'll praise you, O Lord. I'll praise you. Now, these are verses we're going to memorize. These are good verses for the new year, aren't they? Now, some will say, well, now, there are good, reasons for, good verses for the new year, maybe. But you're asking us to use them the whole year long and to use them week after week as, as a call to worship. Yes, I want us to say these words, these verses, every Sunday in 2021. Why every Sunday? Why is that? Well, here's why in our fourth and final observation about Psalm 86. Because these verses do not just give us a prayer for guidance and a prayer to unite our hearts. And a prayer to praise God and to show Him praise. But it also gives us a good prayer for calling us to worship. This is a good call to worship. Look at these words again in Psalm 86. Do you see the importance of prayer like this when you come to the worship service? Do you see how this goes? Oh, my friends, it's very important for us when we come into the worship service to pray like this, like Psalm 86 says here. It's very important for us to say, teach me your way, O Lord. Show me your way. Lord, I, I am here to receive. I am not here as a critic. I'm not here as a judge. I'm not here to pronounce upon your, re your revealed word. I'm not for that. That's not why I'm here. Sadly, that's how some folks come to church. I'm, I'm sad to tell you about that. They come with their dukes up, ready to fight God, ready to fuss, they're ready to fight. Well, I don't know whether I believe all that stuff about original sin or total depravity. I'm not sure about that blood atonement. I don't know about that. I'm not sure I like that. These things really get folks like that going about things. But my friends, if you want to be blessed in the worship services in 2021, you've got to come here with an attitude and a heart that says, Here I am, Lord. Teach me. Teach me your way. I'm not here as a critic. I'm here, O oh God, to receive your teaching, your word. And I'm here to have my life shaped so I can walk according to your truth, like David says. And these are good verses for that, for a call to worship, because we've all battled this thing like David has. Haven't you had a divided heart where things are pulling at you, trying to get your mind off the things of God? When you come to the house of God, you may say, well, now, wait a minute. You mean it's hard to concentrate on the sermon? Well, just ask yourself, has your mind ever wandered during a sermon? You don't have to raise your hands. You don't have to do that. But folks, I know how this works. I mean, the devil fights you. You think this is just a, a, a passive thing? We're just sitting here listening to some guy get up there and, and spit and stomp and yell and scream. Folks, it's more than that. The devil's fighting you right now. You come here and, and Brother Rob leads us in, in, in God-honoring praise and, and then the preacher stands up to preach and, and somewhere along the line, you start thinking about what you've got to do tomorrow or the next day or the next day. You may be even making your grocery list right now in your mind. Oh, now, wait a minute. How do he know that? I don't know. Maybe you are. Or you may be thinking about what you've got to do or where you've got to go this week or where you've got to be and all this. All of this is a divided heart. It pulls your heart apart. And we will worship well, ladies and gentlemen, in 2021 if we will pray, teach me your way, O Lord. And if we pray, unite my heart to fear your name. Unite my heart, Lord. Unite my heart. And we will worship well if we'll say to the devil, I'm going to praise the Lord. I don't care what you throw at me. I'm going to praise the Lord. He has shown great mercy to me. I will praise him because he's been so good to me. May God help these verses, not just to be verses that we repeat each Lord's Day like some sort of routine or monotony, but that they will be the glad confession of our hearts. 
as we come to this place Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to worship God. So before we pray, would you say these words with me one more time from Psalm 86, verses 11, 12, and 13. Would you say them with me? Here we go. Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy toward me. Let's bow and pray together. Father, we bow before you and we thank you that you inspired David through your Holy Spirit to write these words so many thousands of years ago that speak to us today in the 21st century about what matters most, about how to face any year, new year, old year, any year. This is how to face it, for us to pray for your guidance, God, because we need it every day of every year. However long we live, we need your guidance. So, Lord, would you teach us your way? Would you help us to walk in your truth? And, Lord, we also need your help for our hearts to be united around the things that matter and not divided over the things that don't. Not to have our minds wandering when we're sitting in the house of God, praying, singing, listening to your word, but united in our own hearts and united together as hearts together in a church family that loves each other and loves you. And Lord, we need your help to praise you forevermore. Oh, Lord, our God, to praise you because you are so good to us. You are abundant in mercy to us. You've shown us such great forgiveness and mercy and grace. And Lord, this really is a prayer to come, to call, to worship the Almighty God. Would you help us to take these words, keep them in our pocket, keep them in our purse, keep them in our house, on our refrigerator, on our table, somewhere where we can see it and see it and see it and really get these words into our minds, into our daily thinking to teach us your way, God, to unite our hearts so that we praise you forevermore. And today, God, if there is someone here whose heart is divided. They've never trusted you. They've never asked you to save them, to forgive them. They've ever, never asked you to come live within them. Even now, God, we would pray for that heart, that divided heart, to be united to love you and serve you and follow you. And for others that need to follow you in other directions, in terms of baptism or membership or service or reconciliation or whatever it may be, God, even now, would you unite our hearts to do what is pleasing and honoring to you? Because you deserve that, God. You deserve our praise. For you alone are God. Oh, would you hear our prayer as we ask all these things to be done for your sake, your kingdom, your name, your glory in this church, in this house of God throughout the course of this year. We ask this in Christ's name.